we are good we are live we are live yeah okay so very good evening and at the outset i would like to thank entot for uh, arranging everything for us and i would like to thank dr rashmin gandhi as well for agreeing to be uh, to bring this course on the uc platform Uh, so i'll introduce the speakers as they come for their talks before that we have a very uh, distinguished panel with us as well uh, we have dr kasturi bhattacharya ji uh, she has been my mentor and she is a director of clinics and academics as ssn guwahati she is a double frc as both edinburgh and glasgow and she heads the department of uh, cataract oculoplasty and refractive surgery as well then we have dr digvijay singh he is the president of a young ophthalmologist society of india and he is the director of noble eye care in gurugram and he heads to other ophthalmic departments as well uh, then we have dr apurva ayachit she is a consultant at uh, mm joshi eye hospital and uh, she has been the academic uh, in charge for yoc and uh, as per her international qualifications she has done fico and pursuing frcs as well we have dr aarti heda she is a consultant at kki hospital in pune and she has a lot of examinations successfully done under her belt uh, and a lot of uh, south african examinations as well so she'll be talking about that with us and last but not the least we have uh, dr vanashree nayar uh, she is in fico and frcs glasgow and she's a consultant at kirdhar eye institute Uh, so may i invite uh, dr rashmin gandhi to uh, kindly start the session and give a brief introduction uh, to the session for our audience so you need to unmute yourself thank you divkant and thank you yosi for uh, this platform and we are very happy to discuss uh, an important facet of our training uh, that is the other exams like ico royal college of surgeons at edinburgh royal college of surgeons and physicians glasgow royal college of ophthalmologists uh, london and also about uh, how do we crack the fellowship viva uh, we have a, a great uh, okay of speakers with us and we would go through each one of these uh, topics in detail so uh, we have we have a discussion on uh, frcs edinburgh frcs glasgow and frc of also we would have discussion on ico the exams and the fellowships so i'll let uh, divkant then proceed with the program yes sir. and i forgot to introduce one of our panelists dr indeevar mishra he is a treasurer he hand handles all our finances at uc and he runs his own private practice in mumbai as well uh, so we will start the session with uh, dr devendra venkat ramani who is a, a vr consultant at uh, lakshmi eye hospital in mumbai and he has been uh, successfully uh, uh, start doing a course a refresher course on frcs which is very popular right now so over to you thank you uh, thank you yosi and uh, all the office bearers for this opportunity and uh, i'll jump right into it we'll start Part of with FRCS examinations and how we can sort of crack this code, which is quite puzzling to many of us. So, um, for everybody's knowledge, there are basically three major royal colleges in the UK: uh, the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, uh, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow, and the Royal College of Ophthalmologists, which is based in London. And as you can see, they all have uh, very long histories and a hoary past. and naturally that comes with a lot of tradition and um as indians probably we are uh, beholden to all things colonial and we may have a bit of a colonial hangover which is maybe one of the reasons we are attracted to these colleges and examinations so uh, let's see exactly what we are talking about the first examination of the first uh, college which is uh, you know of great importance to ophthalmologists is the royal college in glasgow and uh, of course glasgow is uh, in scotland which is as of now at least part of the united kingdom and as you can see it's a very historic city and just be showing you a few of the photographs that i took when i went there for my convocation glasgow is the heart attack capital of europe and you can see that uh, they deep fry everything that's a deep fried mars bar and believe me it was quite disgusting so uh, it contributes to their cardiovascular disease that's a good friend of mine and uh, 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 dr asif virani from thane and both of us studied together for this examination 
under the guidance of Dr. Rashmin Gandhi. So um, that's the two of us at the convocation dressed in our Harry Potter robes. And you can see that the uh, ceremony itself is conducted with a lot of pomp and pageantry and there's a silver mace and uh, everyone in flowing robes. So it's, it's great fun to go and attend that once you've completed your examinations. But probably I'm starting at the end and not at the beginning. So let's start with what are the parts of this examination. And as you can see, there are different parts. The first part is essentially basic sciences and optics, which is an MCQ test. Uh, that uh, Clearing that makes you eligible to appear for part two, which is a clinical science examination. Now this part two is also subdivided into an MCQ test and a written paper. The MCQs would obviously be on clinical sciences, but the written paper comprises of four questions. It's a, uh, it's, um, a two hour examination in which you need to answer three questions on ophthalmology. And there'll be one compulsory question in which, in which passing is compulsory on general medicine, which is basically a medical emergency that one would likely encounter during the course of ophthalmic practice. The third part is uh, further subdivided into the structured oral examination, also known as the VIVAs, and the clinical examination part. And the structured oral examination and the clinical examination I'll be dealing with in a little more detail a little later. How, well, how does one become eligible for these examinations? So for the first part, you need to complete your internship post MBBS and one year of post qualification training. So essentially, I'm sure everybody who's attending this webinar is already qualified or eligible to appear for the uh, first part. But part two is a little tricky. You need to have completed five years of postgraduate training, uh, sorry, post qualification training, that is post MBBS training, of which at least four and a half years should be in order. All of us would be old and infirm and on our, almost on our deathbeds if we have to give six attempts for each of those parts but uh, it's just out there on the website along with a lot of other information. So I refer you to this excellent website, the official website of the Royal College, and they are very well updated with all the latest information and rules and guidelines changes. Moving on to the next college, which is the college in Edinburgh. Now this college used to offer the MRCS and FRCS examinations, which used to be a three part examination, but now it is in partnership with the ICO since the last year, year and a half, and as you can see, another slide taken from the website, which shows you the reciprocity between the ICO examinations and the Royal College of Edinburgh examinations. So essentially, if you appear for the ICO examinations, you set yourself up to become eligible to obtain the degrees of MRCS Edinburgh and subsequently FRCS Edinburgh. So uh, essentially what, what has happened is the Royal College in Edinburgh has stopped conducting their own examinations and has sort of, in a sense, outsourced that aspect of the college to the ICO. All these details and more would be available on the official website of the college, which is rcsed.ac.uk. Coming a little bit to about how these examinations are conducted and how they are graded. This is uh, a technique called the modified Angoff technique. We, in India, we are used to having a pass percentage that that means if you score above 50% or 40%, you pass whatever uh, else your peers may score. However, in this type of examination, it's not so simple. What happens is that based on the difficulty of the paper, and this is assessed by the panel of examiners, if they feel that the examination is a particularly tough one, then the pass mark is lowered. If the examination is deemed to be relatively simple, the pass mark is uh, raised. So you can see that it's, it really sets a more of a level playing field for all the um, examinees because uh, it's, it's, it's not so much your bad luck as to getting a bad paper that caused you to fail, but uh, something a little more, uh, that's a lot more objective. So how does one prepare for these examinations? I'll take you in brief to what I used and the books I used uh, while studying. So the part one, which is optics, I would uh, naturally recommend um, you know, the best sellers in this field, which are uh, those of A.R. Elkington and the uh, uh, textbook by A.K. Kurana, Clinical Optics is an excellent reading. Uh, of course, it's a little bit in detail, but uh, of course, it, it, if you can go through it, it's, it's wonderful. And I'm sure if you read these two books, you will sail through the optics and refraction part. With regard to the um, basic sciences aspect, uh, excellent book by John Ferris, MCQs in Basic Science. And a um, little more in detail is the I, Basic Sciences in Practice by John Forrester. 
Now, the textbook by John Ferris is actually uh, very useful because not only does it give you the questions and answers, but it also tells you why those answers are right and why some of them are wrong. So it's, it's rather useful like a guide to get you through the examination. Also, incidentally, John Forrester was uh, awarded the honorary FRCS at the same convocation that I was privileged to attend. So that's another bit of... Uh, um, in part, the MS and DNB syllabus is essentially all you need to know. It's not something that's uh, rocket science. You really, uh, if you've studied well for your MS and DNB, you have, would have no problem passing the, the second part. But as a self-assessment, I would recommend this textbook, by uh, this uh, uh, review manual by Jeffrey Lankin, which is again in the, in the MCQ format and very useful for appearing for this part. Uh, coming to that question on emergency medicine, I would strongly recommend reading the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine. This is an old edition. You would, it would, uh, the, the cover would be different now, but uh, it has a wonderful section at the back of the book with a little red margin, which takes you through all of these essential emergencies. And I would strongly recommend going through all of those, in a sense, uh, memorizing the flowcharts that are given there because it's, uh, it's, in a sense, expected to know the emergency management, including dosages of various drugs. Uh, the reason I say this is because these are the guidelines on the website which tell you that in this part, you need to be able to assess the situation, establish a preliminary diagnosis, etc., and stabilize the patient's condition pending arrival of specialized assistance. And also, you, you also need to have some basic knowledge of normal and abnormal ECG. Uh, that is something that uh, could be asked in the Viva, probably not in your question and answer paper, of course. So a few tips. For all of these examinations, I think this would be a common vein that you would find in uh, subsequent speakers' talks as well, is that you need to be very practical. Indian examinations are very, in a sense, theoretical. But here, theory is not even tested in the theory examination. You would get clinical approaches, clinical scenarios, uh, with, in which you need to discuss your approach. So um, that's the way you would have to formulate your answer. A methodical and planned answer would be really required. In general, this is the schema that one needs to follow while answering. It would, uh, your, your answer would have to start with a life-threatening condition or something that is very common and dangerous. Subsequently, something that's vision threatening threatening and last would be something of cosmetic importance. So due weightage has to be given to this schema and uh, you know any violation of this would probably be held against you in some manner. The part three as I said is com uh, comprises the viva and the clinical examination. They call it the structured oral examination but essentially it's a, a 20 minute uh, ex uh, per, uh, per table in which you are examined by two examiners uh, the first table is on lids, oculoplastics, and anterior segment. The second on posterior segment. And the third on neurology, motility, and general medicine. Here you will be shown slides or pictures or printouts of various investigations. Or a clinical scenario would be read out to you and you would be asked questions on those. After every 10 minutes, the examiner changes. So you, 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 you have no scope of getting a lenient examiner and your friend getting a difficult examiner because everybody is examined by all the examiners. It's a structured examination. I would uh, say that uh, there are specific questions and the examiner can only ask you those questions and the examiner has a model answer sheet in front of him or her. So you would need to hit those keywords while giving your answer. And if you do hit those keywords, uh, you should clear uh, the examination. Uh, it generally moves from an easy to difficult sub part. I leave this bit to Dr. Gandhi, who will be speaking a little more on this in detail. The clinical examination comprises of four subparts, and that's the anterior segment, the posterior segment, neuroophthalmic and ocular motility, and oculoplastic and lid disorders. In uh, our MS and DNB, we probably left some of these uh, for choice, as it is, co as it is called. Uh, you know, we probably didn't examine, we didn't study oculoplastic cases or neuroophthalmology cases in as much detail. But in this examination, if you fail in one of these sections, you fail the examination. So, uh, you know, you have to, you, you cannot leave these topics at all. And a lot of weightage is given to these. You have 12 minutes here at each station. And uh, the, the, uh, the maxim is if you see more patients, it means that you're doing well, which is why the examiner is giving you an opportunity to do even better. So um, par for the course would be at least two or three patients. Uh, in general practice pays. It's very important to be fluent in your description because there's no time to talk to the patient, take a detailed history, 
A lot of this would be covered by Dr. Gandhi, so I won't go into detail. But if you practice, because this, this, I only want to stress on this because Indian examinations don't really uh, gear you up for this type of examination pattern. So you need to get your mind into that uh, uh, sort of mindset before you can really uh, feel confident of appearing. Certain advantages which probably would be elicited in our panel discussion also is that you essentially don't need to give lab if you uh, wish to go to the UK, you can directly register yourself with the GMC. The examinations do offer you better remuneration packages in the Middle East. It, um, it, once again, I, 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 I would just like to say I'm not a career counselor, but in many page, uh, places it's accepted as a valid degree in ophthalmology. Now, every country has its own licensing examinations and rules and regulations. So uh, don't take my word for it, but I would strongly suggest that uh, uh, you look at each individual country before you make a choice. Um, why would you want to give this examination? Personally, for me, I had no um, uh, interest in emigrating or moving to a different country, but probably there was always this uh, feeling of uh, a joy of giving examinations and adding to your post nominal initials, which is what drives a lot of people giving these exams. So one doesn't need to really go to this extent of this scholar of medicine and have this type of, uh, you know, uh, CV, but it does, uh, you know, uh, add to one's uh, sense of self-importance and uh, self-image, especially in a in a setting today where medicine is uh, deals with patients who are a lot better read and a lot uh, better exposed to uh, um, advances in medical sciences. The few, just a few disadvantages are that it does not technically allow you to practice anywhere. In a sense, it's not a licensing examination. And of course, it's, it's uh, in a sense, grotesquely expensive. So I would only suggest if you are sure that you want to go down this path, you commit yourself. There's no point in spending uh, thousands of rupees and not giving the final part, uh, getting disheartened and demoralized and uh, not, you know, and uh, uh, cashing on what you've already spent in. These are just a few snapshots of our uh, successful four years of com conducting this course. And you can see uh, some of the panelists and some of the speakers are also in uh, participating here today. Um, honestly speaking, I don't know how this is going to shape up in the post-COVID uh, scenario, but um, let's see how we can take this forward. And with everybody's uh, help and support, I'm sure we'll do uh, something different and something interesting. Uh, just to end with this slide, if anybody's interested, interested in that course, which gen is generally conducted in the month of July or August. That's the number to contact. And for all of you who are appearing for these examinations and in different stages of your training, I would just like to say thank you and all the very best. Thank you so much, Dr. Devend. Uh, are there any comments from, from the panel or questions? So we can uh, move to the next talk. May I request Dr. Rohan to upload his slides in the meanwhile? So I think we'll go ahead with Dr. Rohan's talk and maybe uh, discuss the questions after Dr. Rashmin's uh, talk. Uh, so Dr. Rohan Savant is an ophthalmologist with more than 10 years of experience. He has worked with uh, Beyond Eye Care in Ethiopia and has been mentored by Dr. Rashmin Gandhi. Uh, he has a lot of degrees to his credit, like Dr. DNB, FRCS Glasgow, MRCS Edinburgh, FRC of Thal. FICO, and presently he's working in Isle of Wight in the UK. Sir, please continue with your talk. Uh, thanks a lot, Devakant, for the introduction. At the outset, um, I'd like to thank Rashmin, sir, for giving me this opportunity to uh, to present. I also uh, would like to thank EOC and uh, the sponsors and Todd as well. Uh, well. Devendra briefly mentioned in his talk about the joy of giving exams. I must say I've had a lot of joy looking at that, um, you could say. Uh, now coming to uh, my talk, which is FRC of what and how. Uh, as you know, uh, and Devendra mentioned that the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh are quite popular uh, in our part of the world. Uh, Royal College of Edinburgh is not so much. So I'm here to tell you what the college is about and how the exams are conducted. So this is the, the website of the college. They have changed their emblem recently. Um, coming exactly to the college, though, um, 
It was founded in April 1988, and I'm reading what's written on the college website that the college represents the voice of the profession. It was originally formed by the Ophthalmological Society of the United Kingdom and the Faculty of Ophthalmologists. It, it dates back to 1880 uh, by Sir William Bowman, who had a scientific meeting held every year. And except for a few years in the Second World War, it was uh, quite regular. The faculty, which was formed in 1946 by uh, Sir Duke Elder, it was the professional organization then for the ophthalmologists. So the Royal Charter then created the college uh, on the 14th of April, 1988, and the license was granted five years later. So what does the college do? What are the roles of the college? In UK, uh, Royal College sets up all the clinical guidelines, the standards for publication and research. They also set the curriculum and examination of training ophthalmologists in the country. They provide uh, training in eye surgery, maintain standards by giving out clinical guidelines, commissioning, and also uh, continuous uh, audit and data with the quality and safety of eye surgery. And of course, they set uh, standards. An example given in this slide is refractive surgery. They also provide uh, guidance as to uh, how ophthalmology services should be run, uh, depending on how big or small the trust is. One of the main components of the college, which is focused quite recently, is on research uh, and advanced science in the speciality, because uh, they believe that uh, ophthalmology stats are at the forefront of eye health services in the UK. Um, and because of the extensive training and experience, they would be able to provide support to the research. An example of uh, the clinical guidelines. Again, uh, these clinical guidelines are very specific for how uh, ophthalmology practice works in the UK. You can see an example uh, on uh, the right of your screen. Um, most prominent is hydroxychloroquine and the chloroquine retinopathy, which is very, very common uh, as it is frequently prescribed in the UK. This is a list of professional resources that the college endorses and also supports ophthalmologists who are in training and not in training as well. Examples are Research Hub and the college has a list of awards and prizes which uh, uh, are held every year as well. Now, how does FRC Oft help? Uh, based on what's written on the college website and from experience, they consider this as an exit level exam. And this is a necessary requirement to be a consultant in the UK. So with Royal College of Glasgow and the Royal College of Edinburgh, you can get onto the GMC register and be able to practice ophthalmology in the UK. But if you want to be a consultant in the UK, one of the necessary requirements is to appear and pass the FRC of examination. What are the cons? Unfortunately, if you pass the FRC of the examination, it does not give you exemption from PLAB. And the second flip side for uh, practitioners and my colleagues in India is it is very specific to the kind of practice in the UK and in the NHS. Coming to the exam format, uh, as described by Devendra in his previous talk, uh, there are three parts of the FRC of the examination. Part one, again, which includes basic sciences and refraction. Um, theory. Second part is refraction certificate, which is the practical refraction exam. And the third is part two. So we'll go that um, in detail. All these three parts are based on a curriculum, which is known as the OST curriculum, which is ophthalmic surgery training curriculum, which is extensively discussed uh, on the Royal College of Ophthalmology website. Residency in ophthalmology extends over seven years. So the training includes experience in almost every subspecialty over a period of seven years and they have approximately 180 learning outcomes which every trainee has to fulfill before they are given the certificate of completion of their training of course they have to pass the exam along with that once they have that certificate of training and when they pass the examination they're eligible to be a consultant in the uk and these learning outcomes are uh, not straightforward i mean there's a triangulation done so they have been tested objectively, subjectively, and indirect. We'll come back to that later. That is the main part of how the examination is conducted. Now, recently, uh, as recent as October 2019, those examinations 
people require face-to-face -face interaction are being offered by prometric centers by the Royal College. Um, and those are part one and the written part of the part examination, which is basically an electronic computer-based uh, test centers, which is offered in the UK, Ireland, and internationally. Uh, I downloaded this from the list list prometric centers. Uh, the ones highlighted at the bottom of the screen are uh, Mumbai, Chennai, and Kolkata. In bracket are the number of seats or number of people they can offer at any given sitting for part one as well as for part two written. So what's part one fellowship and how do you apply for that? You do not require any of the language experience to uh, be eligible to apply for the exam. So you can be fresh out from the MBBS, give an internship and still apply for the exam. Based on the OST curriculum, and I keep on repeating myself because these exams are based on the curriculum, these part one examinations are uh, based on the learning outcomes of the first two years of what a trainee is expected to achieve in the curriculum. So naturally trainees are expected to pass this examination before they enter the year three of training. It is offered three times in a year, approximately in January, May, and October. Uh, we allowed a maximum of six attempts at this examination. What is the format? There are two types or two ways in which they test you for this examination. First is a three-hour multiple choice question, consists of uh, a single best option out of four answers. And the next is a two-hour constructed response question paper, including 12 questions. Now, how do they test the difficulty? or how do they test how difficult is one particular paper and how to discriminate or differentiate in between different examinations so that the level and standard of passing is maintained. Uh, there are two different ways. There are many ways in which the college tests. This is what they recently follow. One is known as the ABEL method, which uh, is applicable to how they test the MCQs. It depends on the level of difficulty and also the relevance of importance of a particular question. Another method is a borderline candidate method, which depends on the performance of the examiner in each station and the path limit is set based on the regression analysis. So you, you, can, you can imagine based on this, it, there's extensive study and research which goes into a panel of examiners who sit after the examination. They decide what is the appropriate level necessary to pass a candidate or a group of candidates so that there is no partiality in between different examiners. So if you appear for two examinations, for example, you would be having the same level of difficulty to pass the examinations. It doesn't differ in between exam to exam. The tricky bit is there is marginal cross compensation. So if you perform poorly, slightly in the MCQ paper, and if you perform well in the CRQ or the constructed response question paper, they are able to cross compensate a bit so that uh, the candidate is saved another attempt at the examination. Trying to get uh, into the next slide. This is um, an example of how an MCQ would be. I've, I've given the answer because I don't want to test anyone over here. This is just a reflection of how uh, much um, difficulty or ease is expected in the examination. So um, if you want me to read it out, uh, they want you to answer which is the most likely correct statement uh, regarding optic nerve, whether it's completely myelinated at the time of birth or it's ensheathed by epineurium, perineurium, and endoneurium, uh, whether Schwann cells are responsible for maintenance of uh, myelination. Uh, the correct response is D, which is the subarachnoid space is much narrower into the intracranicular and the orbital part. So this is just an example to give how an MCQ is set. CRQ, um, Coming to it, it's, it's basically they'll give you a picture, for example, they'll give you a basic OCT scan, they'll give you arrows marked as A, B, C, D, and they'll ask you a few questions based on that uh, as to what A means, B means, how is B related to A. So those kind of questions, let's just give an example. How to prepare, I think Devendra has touched on this um, previously uh, about the books. The books remain the same, mm, John Ferry's. Uh, one important uh, book I feel for this examination is to read Forrester. It's an extensive book. Uh, it has got a lot of things uh, 
which need to be read over and over again to be able to uh, get well versed with it. But I think it's a good read for this examination. There are also a few practice question resources, which uh, if you if you browse on Amazon and if you type FRC of part one, I'm sure you'll get a lot of resources. But these um, list of books and practice questions are endorsed by the college website. So you'll get all this information on the college website. There are a few online resources. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are aware about the QR website, which uh, I think is the guide to everyone who's giving fellowship examinations, be it uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh, or the Royal College. Uh, a specific website which I would recommend and I used for my part one exams was idoxford.co.uk. Uh, when I gave the examination, it was in this trial phase, so they let me enroll for free. Now there's a small fee to it, but it, it's got a good question base nevertheless. EOFTA is one website which offers uh, a lot of resource and uh, specific to do with optics, MedRounds is a very good website. Uh, this revision course, which is uh, at the bottom of my slide, uh, is the Institute of Ophthalmology London revision course, but again, it's a, it's a UK based. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it if you're to travel from India to UK for the course. If you follow diligently the resources on this and the previous slide, which has given, that should be more than enough. I did not attend any course given this examination. Coming to the next group of examination, which is the refraction certificate, again, the college specifically mentions that you do not need any previous ophthalmology experience to uh, apply for this examination, the same as part one. So again, you're fresh out of MBBS, you want to join ophthalmology, you can practice refraction for a few months and give this examination. As always, it is curriculum based. Um, for trainees in ophthalmology in the UK, they have to pass it before completing the year three. And there are three to four sittings every year. And again, maximum six attempts are allowed. A format is a face-to-face -face OSCE 10 stations, wherein specifically there are uh, six stations on retinoscopy, three patients. So you have to test both eyes for three patients. Time limit is five minutes for each OSCE station, but the stations are in pairs. So um, each paired station will have a 10 minute interval. Candidates are permitted to divide this 10 minute period in between the eyes they wish. So you can spend six minutes in one eye and four minutes in the other eye, but you should still come out with the results. This is uh, an example of how the OSCE sitting takes place. So there are five rooms, 10 minutes each room. Uh, a lot of it is based on practical retinoscopy. So it makes sense that you either beg, borrow, or steal a retinoscope practice at least for three to four to six months. Do as many retinoscopies as you can do. Get it cross-checked from a good, op good optometrist, which I did as well when I was practicing. I, I cross-checked it uh, with the optometrist and try to challenge them, try to challenge yourself and you'd get to the bottom of this. Uh, how is it marked? Each OSCE station, 15 marks, so a total of 150 marks. And the pass mark on refraction is based on another method called Hofsky method which uh, charts into, um, they take a minimal acceptable failure rate, which is obviously zero. Maximum acceptable failure rate uh, would be 100. Then a minimum cut score, even if all examinees failed, and the maximum cut score if all examinees passed. So they chart these in pairs, take a graph, and the point at which all these lines intersect, they put a one standard error of mean uh, as an additional passing limit, uh, and that's how it's marked. Coming to the part two fellowship examination, uh, once you pass the part one and the reflection certificate exam, you're eligible to give the part two written and oral examination. So uh, look at my second point here. This is what I've copied from the college website. It says that the written and oral examinations combined, they form a synoptic exit examination. That's what they are focusing on. They want this and they uh, arrange this examination and conduct this to be an exit examination which uses several different and complementary assessment methods to test you. They expect that you demonstrate a depth of knowledge and understanding expected to be an independent consultant in the field being tested, not specifically to do with a subspecialty, but you should have um, that much of knowledge that any subspecialty patient comes to your clinic, you should be able to manage it without directly referring them for example, to a pediatric ophthalmologist or to a specialist neuro ophthalmologist. You should be able to deal with it yourself. That's what they expect out of you. 
Now, uh, before it was combined, this examination, the oral as well as the written. So they used to give the written examination and then appear for oral examinations three months later. If you fail the oral examination, you go back again, write the written bit, give the oral bit again. Thankfully, they have decoupled it. Once you pass the written examination, you need not give it again, even if you fail the oral examination. Now, uh, the college had the recent discussion with the General Medical Council, thought that six attempts is way too much for someone to give uh, written and oral, so they've reduced it to four attempts, so that's what they're offering. And in terms of trainees, they should pass this examination before the completion of the training, that is before year seven. Coming to the written bit, it is held twice a year. Uh, you can give it uh, at a prometric center with the centers which I mentioned previously in my slide. It, uh, it consists of two MCQ papers, 90 MCQs, single best answer from four options, two hours each with an hour break in between. Uh, again, it's curriculum based. Now there is um, the distribution which I'm going to, uh, yeah, which uh, this is a blueprint of how uh, and how much weightage they give. If you scroll down uh, to the top bit, that is clinical ophthalmology going down to the last bit, there are a few questions of medicine. There are a few questions of neurology. Okay, and no, this is no, not no. specifically uh, uh, to uh, of your talk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, not specific to uh, neuro-ophthalmology, it's general neurology as well. Pharmacology also has uh, a lot of weightage. And if you scroll down again, there are questions that ask you on statistics, research, ethics, economics, guidelines, for example, and we'll come back to that later. Uh, just bring you a couple of examples of how an MCQ is set. Again, all these are copied from the college website. You can go to the college website. You will find these over there. This is one which I wanted you to see particularly. So this is an example. So you think, oh, wow, this is an EPDRS study question. It's not. They want you to know what is the number needed to treat. And this is what they expect from you, that you should be well-versed with that because that has practical significance once you enter into practice for your research. How to prepare? I, I wouldn't stress too much on this. Devendra has already gone through this. Uh, main reading of the Oxford Handbook is very diligently followed. Uh, I think it is followed for uh, um, Online question banks, you can go through off the questions, which I found very useful when I was preparing. A special mention that you need to read statistics in detail because they ask a lot of questions in the theory that is written by as well in the practical bit. These are a few resources. If you go to the college website, you will see that the college publishes their own clinical guidelines. I gave a snippet of that earlier. You have to diligently follow that because that's what they expect. It's been written by examiners of the college and they expect you know that in detail. NICE guidelines are also very well followed and asked in the examinations. A special mention about uh, vision requirements for driving because ophthalmologists are the first line or the second line of contact for people asking for a driver's license in the UK and GMC guidelines as well. Uh, we, have even, we have touched on the ABLE method previously. That's what they expect uh, in examinations. Coming to the oral bit, once you pass the written, you are eligible to give the oral examination. It is held twice a year in the UK, uh, April and November, and uh, interestingly, it's held once in Singapore. Because I believe uh, a part of Singaporean curriculum is to pass the Royal College of Examinations. Not every hospital follows it, but it's been majorly followed. That's why they, instead of getting Singapore trainees all the way to the UK to give the examination, they have kept an exam specific for Singapore trainees. Maximum four attempts again. Uh, once you pass the written examination, you can give a total examination four times in the next seven years. Structure is VIVA and OSCE. Exams are held from Monday to Friday. So structured VIVA, which is basically a table VIVA, is held on Monday or Tuesday. And OSCE, uh, where is there is face-to-face -face patient interaction, is from Wednesday to Friday. Structured VIVA has five stations. 10 minutes in every station. These are the case-based discussions, uh, first of which is patient investigations and data integration, uh, examples of which I've mentioned over there. For example, they'll give you a biometric printout, ask you a few questions about that. They'll give you an MRI, ask you a few questions about it. Uh, they'll give you a, a chart of electrophysiology, a VEP or an ERD, for example, and you have to discuss, the examiner will ask. It's, it's a preset question, so they have a lot of preset that decided questions where they ask and grade your courses. 
Second is patient management one and two. These mainly deal with emergency ophthalmic conditions because you cannot test a candidate for emergency ophthalmic conditions in a practical patient to patient setting. So they focus that more in trochlear neoplasia and uh, emergency neuroophthalmological presentation. Fourth station is at Fourth station is attitude, ethics, and responsibilities. This uh, goes into more to do with uh, practicing in the UK. For example, duties of a doctor, GMC um, uh, recommendations and GMC guidelines. If you suspect child abuse, uh, uh, critical incident reporting in hospital setting, or if, you're, if, for example, if your colleague is not performing poorly, uh, how do you report, how do you go about that? Uh, fifth station is audit research and evidence-based medicine. Again, this is uh, specific to do with guidelines, driving rules, screening at drug side effects in the UK. Now, the last station is uh, an OSCE station, which uh, is a part of the OSCE that is uh, taken care of in the wire bit because it involves a 10-minute station where there is an actor who will come to your clinic, you're given a scenario, and the actor will act in front of you, and you have to interact with the actors and then the examiner will see you how you perform. And uh, the scenario may include, you have to take history from the patient for ptosis, for example, taking uh, consent for surgery, some form of counseling. Sometimes the actor will say, he's not happy the way you're treating him or your colleague is treating him. He sniffs alcohol from your colleague and, you're, and he's not happy and you have to console him basically in a professional way and explain to him what next you're going to do and how best you're going to offer help. So from first to fifth station, there is one examiner. And for the last of the communication skills station, there are two examiners. One is an ophthalmologist and another is a lay examiner uh, who is a non-ophthalmologist. Coming to the OSCE exam, there are five stations, 20 minutes. Each station, two examiners will test you. They'll, you are supposed to see three patients in each station for 20 minutes. That's anterior segment, glaucoma and lid, posterior segment, strabismus, and orbit, and neuroophthalmology. Now, station six is the communication skills station, which logistically has already taken place in the wire bit. Um, no, we need to conclude. Yes, uh, just give me one minute now. Um, this is an important bit of the Royal College examination. There is uh, a system called a red flag system. If they find that the candidate is not performing poorly, not speaking properly, not practicing safely, because the patient to patient contact, they alert the senior examination examiner who raises the red flag on the mark sheet and that red flag goes to where your training and your trainer is told that this candidate has got a red flag in pediatric ophthalmology for example you need to brush up his or her skills pass mark setting we will um, will not go with that but uh, again there's the borderline candidate method used there is a little bit of cost compensation um, for uh, uh, for viva you have to do well in the oski bit if your patient to patient interaction is good and you marginally don't do uh, well in the viva bit they're happy to compensate it but it's not the other way around so how to go about uh, with the viva i think uh, uh, the vendor has touched it a bit i'll just go into it briefly uh, for the viva bit you have to study clinical scenarios go to your clinic pick up a biometry uh, print out ask questions yourself look at an oct ask questions yourself prepare in that way for OSCE, again, it's practice, 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 especially subspeciality clinics and patients. So if you do not have a neuroophthalmology department, find a neuroophthalmology department near you. Get in touch with the consultant. Ask help. I'm sure everyone will be happy to help you. There are the resources, NICE guidelines, which are diligently followed in the UK, college guidelines, GMC documents, DAVLA, which is the uh, driver's vehicles uh, uh, agency, strategic papers, and in, in some cases, they give you a paper and ask you to critically appraise the paper as well. Remember, the college says, and from my experience, this is an exit level examination. They expect you to have a high level of knowledge and a high level of demeanor. They watch you very, very carefully. So you need to be on the top of your game, knowledge-wise and conduct-wise as well. They even mark you for your facial expressions and also for the way you speak. Also remember, as I was told to remember, to remember to switch the slit lamp off before you answer any question. The trick is to prepare early, score well. The best way to pass is to treat each patient in the clinic as an exam case and include the day-to-day -day methods of how, what the college recommends you to uh, for a good level of knowledge and safety. Good luck. Thank you. All the best.
Thank you so much, Dr. Rohan. Uh, now, uh, let's move on to the next talk uh, with Dr. Rashmin. Uh, so he's somebody who doesn't need an introduction, but uh, still we'll try. So he is a world-renowned neuro-ophthalmologist and educator and a clinician par excellence. Uh, so sir, you don't have any slides, right? Okay, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Dipkant. Uh, and this is the course that we have been doing at uh, All India Astrological Society's annual meet. Uh, it was conceptualized by me, Dr. Nakshi, Akshay, and Devendra. And uh, Akshay has been responsible to get it on the webinar platform under uh, UOC banner. And thank you, Akshay. Thank you, Dipkant, for getting it here. Let's get going. Um, the viva that you encounter. Uh, in Royal College exams are a little different from what uh, you would encounter in the Indian exams. Uh, there, are, there are a few differences, philosophical differences, and there are a few differences which, uh, from the preparation point of view. Uh, in most instances, as was mentioned by Devendra and also by Rohan, that uh, the Viva also includes a lot of clinical scenarios. You always need to make sure that when you are answering a question, you think of a, a life-threatening problem which can be associated with the topic that is being discussed, a sight-threatening problem of uh, the disease entity and also life-threatening or a sight-threatening problem of your management. And that's something that has to be highlighted. Now, a lot of times the question that will be asked in these exams, uh, very rarely you would be asked to enumerate the causes of a particular entity or you know, it'll be very rarely that you'll be listing out things. It always be the explanation and application of what you've learned so far. So let's let's take some examples. Let's see that, you know, most uh, viva uh, like in Indian Indian exams and here would start with a scenario, and the scenario can be a, a scenario which uh, examiner will describe to you, or it'll be a fields, or it'll be a photograph. So let's say if you're shown a photograph of bilateral disc edema. And in most instances, it will be presented to you either on a laptop, on a pad, or uh, the printouts will be given to you. And either there'll be a specific question or you may just be asked to describe what you're seeing. So let's say you, you have a, a bilateral disc edema photo, photograph given to you and the examiner tells you these are the optic discs that you saw in a 24-year-old female who is slightly overweight. Now, uh, a lot of times the mistake that we make when we are answering this question is that we start saying that I would like to take a detailed history of the patient. I'll check the vision. I'll check the color vision. I'll check the intraocular pressure. I'll uh, take a, a detailed uh, fields evaluation and whatnot. Now here, when you answer in this manner, you are listing out what you do, which you would have done in any patient. Even if a patient has come to you for a routine examination, you would have checked the vision, you would have checked the intraocular pressure, you would have checked the fundus. So uh, examiner is still waiting to understand as to what is your thought process and what is it that you want to convey. So a better way of answering here is that, yeah, 24-year-old female with a bilateral disc edema, my immediate concern is, is this because of raised intraocular pressure? And uh, you are leading then the examiner towards the most obvious, and also the most serious of the problem, which can cause a particular clinical uh, picture that has been given to you. Why it is serious? Because papilledema can be because of raised I papilledema is because of raised ICP, and it can be because of underlying space occupying lesion, which can be life threatening. Patient can develop a brainstem herniation and can die. And even if it's not because of a space occupying lesion, it'll be a side threatening problem because the optic nerve, like in glaucoma because of pressure can die, the neurons will die, and most of these damages are irreversible. So it is always better when these kind of open-ended questions are asked you, you hit the specific saying you're most concerned about a particular problem, and then lead the examiner to discuss that particular problem. And in, in most uh, uh, ex examination scenarios, a particular problem is presented with a, a, a condition in mind. Another example of a question, a viva question that might be asked to you is you are given a scenario saying a, a six, 12 year old kid who has developed jaundice and uh, pedal swelling uh, and he has been referred to you by your pediatrician friend. So now 
you have examined the patient, write a letter back to the pediatrician as to what you've observed. So obviously, instead of asking uh, you directly that what are the clinical features of, let's say, Wilson's disease, is a young patient with John Isamor, he has just given you a scenario, a practical scenario that you will encounter. And here again, you have to make sure that you tell uh, the examiner that you are worried about or you observed uh, for uh, the KF ring on slit lamp using a filter, you look for cataract, you also look for, and if you say that you know Wilson's disease uh, causes extrapyramidal degeneration, uh, and you also look for uh, slowing of saccades, you score a lot of marks. So this is another type of questions which is which we generally don't encounter in our settings, but these are uh, quite often asked in Royal College exams as to write the letter back of a referral that you got for a particular condition. Now the third example can be you are given either a picture or a case scenario saying a, a five-year-old kid who, is, uh, who has a developmental delay and you find that there is subluxated lens which is hampering his vision. How would you manage? So obviously uh, there are two aspects to it. How do you manage a subluxated lens in a kid? And then he has just inserted uh, very benignly uh, uh, one information that patient had a developmental delay. Here, the examiner needs to, wants to know whether are you hitting on the differential of homocysteinuria. Because homocysteinuria can cause subluxation of lens. 90% of homocysteinuria patients would have subluxation of lens if not treated. Uh, and why it is important? Because when you are treating these patients in a pediatric age group, these guys have a GA risk. And you need to highlight it to the examiner that if you're planning for a management, you are aware that there's a GA risk and you would take precaution for this. So this is how most of the, the VIVAs in Royal College exams would present. And the best way to prepare, as Devendra had mentioned, is to have somebody who is writing the exam. And I'm sure Dr. Vanashi was part of the panel, Aarti, they'll all vouch that they all had uh, WhatsApp groups and they all were discussing while they were preparing for the exams. That's something which is extremely important. When you're writing a Royal College exams and you know what is expected and because it's not that the knowledge is different, it's just the representation of knowledge in the exam is different and that's something that you need to practice and for that you require a group. So first thing, always make sure that you have a group. If you don't have somebody who's writing the exam with you or if you're not able to find a group at least as I think Rohan and uh, Tindra mentioned, treat every scenario, every situation in your clinic or in your theory as a potential viva and a clinical exam. So what we used to do is pick up Kansky, just open any random page and whatever picture that you see, start describing that and then try to remember as to are there any life-threatening, side-threatening association and how do you have dealt with a particular question and what are the potential questions. So that, that's something which is very important. Second, always practice to make sure that you give a relevant information because your viva is for a limited time. And in that limited time, you need to impress upon the examiner that you are a safe ophthalmologist for most of the other Royal College exams. For uh, FRCO, you have to demonstrate your, your uh, you know, as Rohan mentioned, knowledge because it's an exit exam. But most other uh, exams, FRCO's exams, you need to convince the examiner that you are a safe doctor and you will be, if you are working under him and he's your consultant, you will be handling his patients safely. So that's something which you need to convince him in those two, three minutes. So give a very relevant, pertinent points back. The second, third thing that you need to practice in a group for a viva is that we are used to either telling that if you see a patient with third no palsy, examiner shows you a patient with third no palsy, you keep saying that, yeah, you have to, make sure that you do MRI, MRA. That's how we answer, but that's not, that's not something which is acceptable in Royal College exam. You have to say that I would like to make sure that the pupil is not involved and then get the MRI and MRA done if the pupil is involved because I'm worried about aneurysm or post communicating artery. So that's something you need to, the lingo, lingo part also, and fairly enough, you, why should an examiner be doing anything on your behalf? Uh, you are his colleague and you should be telling him that this is what you would like to do. So that's something you need to practice. Fourth thing is that maybe, can be, should be, no, you, uh, you imagine even in Vaiva that there is a patient in front of you and this is how you would have guided that patient. And that's something which you need to convey uh, to the examiner. So all these, as I said, if you go back and if you find out in most Royal College exam as to what were the questions that were asked, you'll find that those are very 
basic clinical questions. Cystoid macrolide are the conditions which are discussed, at least to begin with, they are very basic and the conditions that you encounter in your day to day life. It's just that how do you convince the examiner that you are a safe doctor? That's the philosophy for Viva and clinical exam. Again, thank you, Devkant. Uh, I conclude my talk. I will take the questions later after uh, all the talks are okay. okay. Uh, may I invite Dr. Akshay to please share his slides? Yeah. So Dr. Akshay is an oculoplasty surgeon in Mumbai, and he'll be talking about his ICO experience. We can't hear you, Dr. Akshay. Have you? Yeah. I so ICO exam. Examinations in general are an assessment examination. They are not a qualifying examination. Uh, it's an examination that qualify. I mean that that shows uh, lets you know your level of competence in comparison to your peers, because it, there is a, the ISO examinations are formulated on a level of general competence to see how good you are. And as my previous speakers have mentioned, a lot of us have uh, a, a, an affinity for our post nominal initials that we like to put after our name. The latest update with regards to ICO is the reciprocity with the Royal College of Surgeons Edinburgh. The partnership primarily is to ensure that the route from ICO to MRCSED is seamless and opens the door for candidates to take the Part C examination to become FRCSED. As of now, if you see even on the website, they say that this currently is, they are reformulating it as Dr. Devendra mentioned, uh, thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic. But this is in general from the website itself. Right now, if you give your ICO part one, your basic sciences, optics, refraction clinics, as well as advanced, you get an MRCS or a membership following which if you give the ICO advance and the face to face exam, you can then get the FRCS, which is the fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons at Edinburgh. Now, I, coming to ICO fellowships, uh, the overview is that there are three month, six month and one year fellowships available. And the reason why I talk about this is because you can take, give the examinations and it is recommended that you take these exams, sit, sit for these examinations before applying for fellowships. Because if there are multiple people applying for the same number of fellowships, uh, then the one thing that sets you apart from the rest is that you've cleared your examinations. Although technically, uh, we, you can still be awarded a fellowship without having appeared for the ICO exams. Uh, there are people whom I know, but, uh, even the chair of the examinations mentions that it is be better that you have take you take these examinations. Uh, advantages: you may have better job opportunities, and it of course simplifies your pathway through navigating through the FRCS networks. But it does not allow you to practice in any other additional country. Uh, the ICO examinations, like mentioned, they open up the gateway to ICO fellowships, but they are expensive. So, which exams there are? There is a part A, the part B, uh, part C, advanced and the subspeciality examination. The part A is the visual examinations that residents should appear for during their residency. It's a 120 question, four MCQ examinations. As you can see, it's absolute basic sciences, anatomy, physiology, genetics, pathology, epidemiology, and statistics. Part B is, the, uh, is usually combined with part A. It's 60 questions, MCQs over one and a half hours. And if part B, A and B are taken together, the part, the, the candidate must obtain passing marks in each of the two papers separately to apply for part C. And if you do not pass in any one of them, you can reappear individually. Part C is the clinical examinations. Now here, the for your clinical examinations, uh, this is typically taken, if you if you have taken your first part A and part B, <coughs> the basics and the optics, then this can be taken just after your residency. You're fresh from your examinations, you've read your Kansky paper, uh, book, and this is a 200 MCQ based examination where you choose the single best answer. And these are primarily all ophthalmic subjects. You can see their general ophthalmology, pathology, glaucoma, and others. In the advanced examination, which is also just after residency, typically during fellowship, you have uh, 
competence. This is a competency-based examination. Although it doesn't verify training, it checks your competence, practical competence. Now there are ten <coughs> extended matching type of questions and seventy-five contextual questions, which have images, visuals, or graphs, like a like an OCT may be put up or a CT scan may be put up, and it requires you to give the single best answer from all of these. <coughs> now beyond that, they have now. being there is being formulated a sub specialty examination for seven sub specialties cornea glaucoma medical surgical retina ocular plastics neuro ophthal pediatrics uveitis and cataract is combined with all of them this requires you to have cleared the previous parts of the ico and get one year clinical experience required it's a two hour examination with again 80 visual or graphical uh, uh, questions with one best answer which is an mcq so these are the examinations that you can take now you come to the examination fees this is as of january this year if you complete all examinations you would have likely paid upwards of 1.7 lakhs so uh, like devendra said these are expensive examinations they can scare you but uh, that's the way the cookie crumbles you have to take these examinations in order to uh, you know be able to apply for the fellowship resources for the icu examination your basic sciences i will be repeating a little bit because the fact remains that the standard textbooks for optics for exam uh, for refraction and for clinical sciences remain the same regardless of the examination that you give essential reading for uh, your part 1 is clinical optics by elking uh, elkington and dr kurana's textbook both of them are very very useful mcqs by john ferris just to note that icu tends to be a little uh lazy in setting their papers so sometimes you may see that the mcqs for basic science are literally verbatim as is from john ferris textbook john forrester is a little more in depth and it can even help you in your subsequent examinations when it comes to your second examination the clinical sciences the essential review is your Ma massachusetts iron year review by lamkin Kansky exam Kansky's book with clinical ophthalmology is, is something that all of us are familiar with at least when i passed the examination a decade ago this is how it looked like it's now gone into multiple editions and this is the the current edition and and let to believe <coughs> so once you've given all your examinations you can then add your non post nominal initial and then think of the fellowship so fellowships there are different types of fellowships uh like i mentioned on the screen you are, can see the different types of fellowships there are nine in all the three month fellowship there is a three month retinoblastoma three month uveitis and glaucoma fellowship there is a six month retinoblastoma fellowship one year retina fellowship and a one year sub specialty fellowship in the subject of your choice as well as one in ocular genetics and the allergan advanced research fellowship which is for basic sciences typically awarded at the arvo meet in the united states every year i am going to focus primarily on the 3 month fellowship because that is the most commonly uh, sought after fellowship uh, there are 60 to 90 fellowships such uh, such fellowships are awarded twice a year there is the first deadline for is somewhere in april and the second deadline is in september uh, they if awarded it comes with a scholarship of 6000 us dollars they require you to have completed your residency which means if you're still a resident under training you may not be able to apply for these fellowships so think of applying for these fellowships after you finish your pg you must be below 40 years of age and must assure the uh, ico through your application that you are willing to return home and resume your previous position uh, preferably in a training position where you can train others about what you've learned now how to apply the application process is extremely transparent it's on the ico website the the examination website is icoph.org uh first thing is that you choose your fellowship the one that you want whether it's a 6 month or 3 month or 1 year fellowship choose the fellowship complete an eligibility eligibility check the eligibility check requires you to upload your documents uh confirming that you are completed your residency and you are an ophthalmologist your identity check and uh once this is done within 24 hours they let you know whether you are eligible for applying for a fellowship or not once this is done you can then apply to a host training center you choose the training center from the list in the directory which is present there if you see on the left column here uh, the, the the multiple list there is something called fellowship host directory so you can choose the hospital where you want to apply from this list 
and apply directly online. You do not directly need to call up the hospital and ask them. The host automatically gets your application. They review it and they let you know in eight to 12 weeks, there is a particular date that the ICO mentions by when you get to know if you get your fellowship, if you're awarded the fellowship or not. However, for the three month fellowship, once rejected, you cannot apply again. Apply If you want to apply to a center outside the list, the directory, uh, you can do that. Now, this is a screenshot from an email that I uh, wrote to them uh, asking them if I wanted to apply to a center which is not in their list. And they said that, yes, but the first thing is that you need to let us know why you are applying to that center and get a letter inviting you as uh, letting them know that that center is willing to accept you. And once this is done, they may be willing to see why you should be awarded the fellowship and they may agree things that you have to consider is should you do this fellowship before or after your fellowship in india my opinion is that you should do it after your fellowship in india because uh, many times you may not have you may not get hands-on clinical work or operative work in uh, that subspeciality when you're operating when you're doing your fellowship abroad if you've already completed your fellowship in india merely observing adds a lot of value because then you see it and you know whether you can do it or not and because you may apply for a fellowship now in May 2020 but your three month slot may come in September of 2021 so you have to plan accordingly is it worth it it definitely adds value to what you are learning and you there are multiple things uh, that you can learn it improves your network you're able to speak you, you know your your Circle increases, you see how practice is being done in different countries. Uh, don't go for the ICO fellowship if you just want another fellowship or a three-month vacation. Uh, it, if you've completed your fellowship here, you, it can really take your, uh, you know, take your practice to a next level. And uh, like I said, you need to plan and apply. So if you're doing a fellowship here, during your fellowship here is a better time to apply than after your fellowship. Things that you need to ask yourselves is what knowledge and skills you wish to acquire from that fellowship. And these are not questions that you need to ask yourself in, in a, you know, uh, in a self-introspective way. These are actual questions from the ICO form. So you really need to know what you want and answer it in the form and submit it to them. And uh, you need, you know, you, you have to be a little practical on what you answer. What are the practical implications of this fellowship in your practice upon return? Uh, you know, whatever it is you want to come, you want to train people here in that speciality and to serve the community. You don't want to write, I'm going to come back and join my papa's practice in the same. So, you know, obviously then they're not going to give you your fellowship then. Uh, uh, my experience, uh, I was at an oculoplastics and oncology fellowship at uh, New York I Year Infirmary in uh, Mount Sinai, New York. Uh, I was invited to give talks. I was part of the I could visit Memorial Sloan Kettering and do a short two-week observership with uh, Professor Abramson, who's a retinoblastoma and expert. And that is me in the extreme right getting my certificate with my co-fellow, who, whom I'm still in touch with. I was inducted into the New York Iron Year alumnus, and it is it's not just uh, you know socializing. We've written a lot of papers together, so you can make a lot out of your three months' time. And it is only through my contacts and my mentored at the uh, New York Ironier Infirmary that I could get inducted as a, a member of the American Society of Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgeon, only the fourth Indian to do so. So uh, to summarize, uh, you need to plan well, uh, plan much in advance as to when you want to go for your fellowship and how to plan it, plan for it. Take the uh, inputs of all your stakeholders in, involved, if you're, especially if you're planning not just a three month fellowship, but a one year fellowship. You need to speak to your family, your spouse, your possible and your future employers and choose wisely because this is this three months can actually help you change and transform your career. Chart a timeline because, uh, like I said, it is not something even though it's a three month fellowship, it is uh, you to set the wheels in motion. It takes a little longer at the end of the day an IC on examination as well as the IC of fellowship. Both are an asset and can help you in practice building. This is my email address. If you have any questions, you can directly write into me. I'd be happy to reply to you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Akshay, for covering the topic so well. Uh, and on time. And on time, yes. And Dr. Rashman, should we uh, continue with the next talk before taking up the questions, or you suggest we take up a few questions? You're on mute, please.
uh, Minakshi has been waiting for long. So yes, let's, let's go. Now may I invite Dr. Minakshi Swaminathan. She is the academic director of uh, Shankar Netrale Chennai uh, to please tell us about how to crack the fellowship interviews. Thank you, Dilkant, and uh, members of the OC. And uh, wonderful to see all my uh, friends up there as well, both uh, speakers and panelists. Um, my talk today is going to be totally uh, based on whatever has been my humble experience in the last 15 years of uh, holding the post of director academics and uh, conducting interviews. Rashmin and I have been part of interviews interview panels and we have had we have a lot of stories to share uh, maybe in a different forum so without further delay first question is do you really need to do a fellowship is it's just the residency not enough is it a fashion to want to do a fellowship see if you're going to go back to a practice where your father maybe already is an established surgeon and he's hoping to expand into the vitreoretinal area or oculoplasty, well, you may have no choice. You may have to do a fellowship. So maybe you should get mentally prepared. Other scenarios, maybe you're going to go back to a smaller town, uh, a, a, a second tier city, a third tier city, and you all you want to do is to have that is good patience, good standard of living, no need to do a fellowship. If you have done a good residency with adequate uh, surgical exposure from a good um, institute, there is really no need to do a fellowship. So next question I'm usually asked, should I do a, a short-term fellowship or a long-term fellowship? Should I do small, small, many, many fellowships or should I just do one long-term fellowship? But really, again, it depends on what you want to do. If you perhaps want to go to a smaller uh, town and you think, however, you will still be doing ROP screenings and taking care of babies, you may want to buy as contrary. From case, you may just want to vitriol. and uh, oculoplasty, which you would have done very little during your PG. Because a long-term fellowship not only offers such a is what you learn in a long-term fellowship. So Definitely, should you do a fellowship in a big institute or should you choose a small practice where there are many practitioners, one or two small practices uh, with one or two consultants who run a fellowship? There's always this worry that you might end up being just your cheap labor, that you might just be do running their evening clinics or their uh, you know, peripheral branch. At the same time, you can really get to operate, observe, have very little calls, this, this call, that call, ED call, what calls, all this is very less than a small practice. That way a small practice fellowship may be something different altogether. Whereas a big institute fellowship comes up with a lot of scud work. You can't escape that. But you get different perspectives. For example, in our hospital, we have six pediatric ophthalmologists. Each one of us has a niche that we uh, have. And not only that, we have our own style. So if you do a fellowship in a bigger institute with many faculty, you will you have other advantages. Bigger institute also offers platform for doing research, which a small practice may or may not have. It has access to biostatisticians. It has access to um, a good uh, 
basic science research team. So these are kind of advantages if you go opt for a big institute. Of course, the next big question is big speciality. So I will have this candidate who has come for the interview and you ask them, why do you want to do pediatric ophthalmology? They'll say, because uh, actually I didn't have much exposure during my PG. Oops, that should not be the reason why you should be doing a fellowship. What if you join and you find you hate children or you just cannot figure out squint? No, 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 no. You need to be very clear in your mind with speciality. If, are you looking for financial gains, monetary rewards? Are you looking for work, uh, doing something very new, cutting edge? Are you looking, are you, do you love kids? So you want to do pediatric of that. You don't mind standing and operating for hours together with your retina. So you need to be very clear in your mind with speciality and why. Especially when you go to the interview, you better have your answers clear. How does your CV look? So when you apply, along with the fellowship application, you're going to send, send in your CV. So don't list everything you attended in your career. You don't have to put on put where you're middle school, high school. All these things don't need to be there. And be truthful. Uh, don't say that you attended like, you know, 500 conferences during your PG and list it all. It's all very boring. Let it be nice and crisp. Also explain gaps in your CV. At least explain it in your mind. Maybe you took a year off so that you could prepare for your PG entrance. But, be, but make sure that you explain that and be honest about it. Also, let your CV be chronological. Also, let your publications be in the proper style. I hate it when the author names are missing or you have left out the main co-author and you've just scribbled something in the CV. Doesn't look professional at all. A word about referees. So we always ask about references and we say professional references. So your friend, dad's friend, uncle is not a professional reference. Your neighbor is not a professional reference. This is somebody who has worked with you. Only that person can be uh, written down as a first, uh, professional reference. You also need to know the subject before the interview because most of the interviews consist of an MCQ exam and uh, an interview. So there are going to be uh, questions relevant to the subject that you are interviewing for. So you better go prepared. Also, if you have had a long gap between PG completion and fellowship, some people, uh, especially women, they choose to have a small break, they have their children and then go back to, uh, for a fellowship interview. They always ask, ma'am, we cannot compete with the ones that have just come out of the exam. So what stand, the chance do we stand? And I, and I always tell them that, that it's okay, but be honest about it. It's okay to have a gap and we do understand that there are other things besides your career and you should devote time to that. Also, we uh, know your faculty who's going to interview you. For example, I went to um, a New England Medical Center, Tufts. Uh, medical retina was my first uh, love and I interviewed with uh, Dr. Jose Pulido, except I had not read all his papers on PDT. I only knew a little bit about PDT and he just grilled me during the interview and literally threw me out of the, out of the office. So if you know who is likely to be interviewing you, you better know what they have working on, what are their interests and what have they published. Please go familiar with that. Also, if you come, for example, to uh, uh, Shankar Nitralia Chennai and don't know about SN Dreams, when you're applying for a Vitrio Retinal Fellowship, you will not be forgiven. So do your homework before you go for the interview. Arrive early. If you come panting and puffing in the last minute and you've got lost and you're in a new city, uh, it doesn't speak well uh, because then I know you're not a person who prepares for things. How are you going to prepare for a new surgery that you're going to learn if you're not preparing to go to interview to a new place? Have a good breakfast. Take uh, water along with you. Make sure you have a chocolate bar so that you don't get start feeling faint. Appropriate attire and footwear. I cannot underscore this. Please don't come dressed as if you're going to walk the ramp. Don't wear all these high heels. I even know uh, people who come for the interview wearing a white coat. We know you wear a white coat at work. You don't have to come to interview with it. At the same time, you don't have to come like you're going to a wedding with a three-piece suit. What is called, what it is called business casual, come properly attired, polished shoes. So if you come sit there and you're not groomed properly and you have a beard that's not trimmed and you have 
chip nails and you have feeling a nail paint i'm wondering you can't even take care of yourself how are you going to take care of my patients and so grooming very very important in the room when you enter first greet everyone i'll never forget this uh, uh, this now he, he's a big big man he's a big consultant but he walked into the interview room and i was sitting with two other uh, male consultants who were interviewing he completely ignored me and he only wished the other two and here i'm thinking hey i'm the head of head of the department so make sure that you are cordial and that you do not shake your leg and don't bite your nails you see all these uh, behaviors and like i said again be honest and talk about your personal obligations that you have children what is the support system for them if you join be prepared in your mind to be asked about your bond what are you going to say tell them about your speciality be truthful that you went and attended these sessions in the conference and that is why you like this speciality even if you don't know much about it you went and heard these speakers you went and spent some time uh, observing some doctor that is why you like this speciality and and know your publications you would have your father might have put your name uh, and you might have helped him with analysis but that looks very bad if they ask you about your publication and then you're just drawing a blank in the interview and also have a plan for poor surgical training which is not uncommon in our post graduate programs unfortunately you say i'm going to do corneal refractive and if you have done three eccs in your pg aha uh -huh, nobody is going to give you a, a, a you know a fellowship so have a plan say I, you know maybe you're going to do a faco fellowship maybe you're going to apply for a short term sics fellowship have a plan and that is all i have to say to you and i'm sure you will crack the fellowship interview with these uh, tips all the best and thank you and uh, i'm happy for any of you to write to me if you have any questions or any further advice that you need and thank you once again you're you're doing a wonderful job and the vacant thank you so much for this opportunity um we should be the ones thanking all of you so uh let us start taking some of the questions that we have the various platforms that we are live right now uh in the meantime that i collect the questions may i uh, request dr kasturi bhattacharya to please uh, uh, give her views on the frcs examination she is a double frcs holder thank you dipakan and thank you you see for making me um in general today lia i basically feel that frcs examination is basically a validation of an ophthalmologist knowledge experience and training and, and like we I mean, we conduct the exam, examination we as the examiner especially we try to check the ophthalmic conditions in the pendant in a safe and professional manner that is very important and we also see that these frcs examinations are basically conducted to set standards of ophthalmic care amongst the ophthalmologists so what we as an examiner we basically like to judge the skill of the ophthalmologists and we also like to judge whether the candidate can manage in a very safe and a professional manner and that was very nicely highlighted by the previous speakers and one advantage of frcs glasgow is that you also get the gmc registration thank you so much ma'am uh, any questions from the panelists uh, before we start taking questions from the uh... and one more thing i'd like to mention rohan has very nicely mentioned when and akshay has mentioned the same thing that it adds to your personal advantage like you can have a internationally recognized post nominals you can have a better networking opportunity and the most important is that you are eligible to join the frcs community like the royal college community and that definitely enhances your professional portfolios so it does have uh, advantage both on your personal ground and also on the ground of the patients because you turn up to be a safe examiner giving a safe management to the patients right. and ma'am do you think there is uh, any advantage of having the double frcs that you have 
It's nothing. I don't think there's an advantage because, as already mentioned by the previous speakers, it's basically internationally recognized post nominals, and that is what many people they like yeah, like to have it. But in my case, in I appeared for my forces Edinburgh. I went to Edinburgh, and that is in 2003. I passed my forces Edinburgh, and the second forces was basically an honorary, which as because I'm an examiner for the last 15 years, I'm an examiner for Francis Glasgow. And so they have decided that all examiners will get, they'll honor them with a Francis Glasgow. And we don't have to pay the membership uh, fees like what we normally for Edinburgh, we need to pay an annual subscription. But for this Glasgow, as because we're examiner, we don't have to pay that. Right. So the first question that we have is, can I please get Dr. Akshay's email address? So probably you can go back to the slides and get his address. Um, Dr. Akshay, if you can answer this, Dr. Ashwarya from Pune has asked ICO, whether ICO has an age limit. Uh, if someone is above 40, what are the options? Yeah, so the uh, three month fellowship uh, and the uh, six month fellowships that they have, have an age limit of uh, 40. The options in case uh, you are older is that you can apply for the one year fellowship, the Fred Hollows mm -hmm. fellowship and the uh, retinoblast or the, uh, uh, the basic science research fellowship, the Allergan fellowship. Uh, the, so these are the two fellowships that are available uh, for long term for one year fellowships and they don't have an age limit. But unfortunately, the three month and the six month have a limit of 40 years. But ICO examination, the examination board is known to be flexible. You can still approach them and mention them, mention to them in an email. Uh, Cordula Obelmeyer is the, uh, is the person point contact. And she is the person who receives all emails. And she personally makes it a point to reply. So uh, I, we, we all know her and she is known to be very accommodative in such uh, request. So it, it's worth a shot. Okay. Yeah, we have some questions from uh, YouTube, the where we have gone live. Uh, two questions. I think I'll just combine both of them. First is I've finished my uh, PG 10 for MLCO and FRCO. And somebody else has suggested that too many books were suggested for FRCO. Can we cut it short? And is there any? Synopsis which you can read to MRCO or FRCO. Because uh, I think it's very uh, inspirational that uh, a friend and uh, someone known to us in the side of Bombay, Dr. Vijaya Paranspe, has cleared those examinations. Uh, and she's happy to mention it at the right page of 52. So there's really no age limit uh, for appearing and clearing. Things. Uh, I guess the second question is uh, for me that I mentioned many books in my list. Uh, for part one, uh, fellowship examination, uh, I guess uh, uh, if you take a cue from Devendra's slide, uh, I mentioned the same books only in in a lining format but uh, uh, i guess that would be that would be enough to part, pass the part one uh, the important thing to remember uh, with the royal college of ophthalmology examinations is it's a very practical exam so although you have a lot of resources in terms of books you don't need to study them exhaustively the point is in picking up the topics which are frequently asked in the exam and preparing them in detail so that preparation in detail requires Adds you to refer to multiple sources because if you go to uh, a previous question bank of the college, it uh, uh, expects you to know uh, a bit more beyond the Oxford Handbook and Kansky. And that's the reason uh, I quoted multiple references because uh, they're looking at a topic, they're not looking uh, exactly from which book you're reading. Uh, I hope that answers the question. All right. Uh, so, Dr. Arthi, can you come in? about uh, your experience with the African examinations. So thank you, Yossi, for uh, giving me an opportunity to be under the great speakers. Uh, we are talking about international exams, some of which uh, I had a pleasure to of completing. 
uh, I've completed some exams of ICO, including the subspeciality exam uh, and uh, FRCS Glasgow and couple of African exams. Whichever exam you take, they uh, your motivation might be very different, but at the end, they it makes you better clinician, according to me. So uh, I have a fellowship of two African uh, colleges. One is College of Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons. Uh, Ghana is a country in the western part of Africa, and uh, the second one I have is from College of Eastern, Southern, and Central Africa, which is called as Coexa. So the first one, Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons, uh, I got elected by uh, the experience or eligibility criteria. Uh, it just need some recommendation and your experience after the fellowship, which is three years. Why you want to take this fellowship is, I motivation for me was I wanted to be in their education body so that I can be part of their education system. The College of uh, Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons Actually, it is a very renowned college in Western Africa. Now coming to the Eastern College of uh, uh, Africa, which is actually the body uh, which includes eight countries. The exam is conducted by Royal College of Ophthalmology, UK. So moderators are from Royal College and the exam, exam is more or less of the same pattern. And refraction is one of the center for that. So it is not very difficult to clear is, is these exams, but yes, it is uh, motivating to have these credentials under your name. Uh, whatever uh, exams you take of ophthalmology remains the same. So there are, I will share my experience of FRCS part two. I gave both NCQ and the theory exam together. And uh, I was giving exam from Africa. I had absolutely no motivation to write these exams. It was just that I had some time in the evening hours and I thought, let me just give a try for these exams. I was taking exam after three years. so It was very, very difficult for me to uh, study for it. What best was uh, uh, for me was Telegram. So I chose some study partners from Telegram and we form a group of five. All my study partners, I have not met them till date. They were, some of them were from Sai and some of them, them were from Syria and we all cleared the exam, all five of us. So group study according to me is very, very, very important. Uh, there are quite a few online sources. My favorite for MCQ was idoc.com. So uh, as one of the speaker has mentioned that it was in initial phases, I have used it in 2018, uh, early 2018. Uh, it has MCQs uh, close to more than 3,700 for part two and thousands for part one. So part one for all exams, wherein there is basic and uh, optics and refraction. The subscription for it is very, very, it comes with very little fee, like uh, 80 to 100 pounds, depending on number of months you want to take the subscription for. And uh, there is one more good website called irounds.org, which is run by University of Iowa Healthcare. So it gives a good idea about the case-based discussion. So other than what our speakers has told, you can include this in your list. So over to you, Devaka. Uh, uh, they have one question. I mean, uh, repeatedly many people have asked on paper. Uh, this is directed towards uh, Dr. Akshay. Uh, can you describe one eighty questions advanced and how to clear them? <laughs> Can you repeat that question? I missed a part of it. Uh, yeah, a lot of people need to uh, want to know that the 180 course which I've been asked in the answer is the pattern. Something about the 180 questions of the FICO advanced exam. I think Devendra might be able to. <clears throat> the advanced ICO. Yeah, so, uh, it's advanced ICO, so when, uh, when I. Uh, appeared for the examination which was uh, 2011 uh, there was a wonderful system of having uh, you answer the question along with the certainty level that you, uh, you have for that answer in a sense you had to um, say whether you are not certain whether you are fairly certain or you're very certain and based on your uh, the accuracy of your answer in the sense whether you got it right or wrong and your confidence level your marks would be determined. So 
essentially if you got it right and you said you were very certain you would uh, get more points but if you said you were uh, if you were wrong and you said you were very certain that your answer was right then you would get more negative points in the middle i believe that system was scrapped and um, uh, that certainty level aspect of it was removed i'm not sure currently whether it still has whether it has been brought back but um, from what i gather uh, it's not there anymore and you just have to answer uh, you just have to give your answer so uh, essentially that's how uh, the system is now um, and there's something that they have called uh, stem which are uh, basically uh, in the same clinical scenario you would have different sub questions and each sub question essentially is a, is a question by its own where you either answer true or false or yes or no so uh, that so in a sense increases the number of questions that you have to uh, you end up answering so yeah. it's a little different pattern from uh, other examinations but um, there's something to be a little watchful of when you're answering yeah just to uh, sorry i had some i couldn't hear the question clearly you are correct from january 2020 that has actually from the last year january 29 2019 that has changed uh, the, there are currently no negative marks for any question that is left behind or answered inaccurately now for the advanced icu you have straightforward multiple choice single correct response questions only yeah i think advanced exam has the extended matching type also 10 questions there are 10 extended matching 10 type, 10 7, 75 uh, uh direct single, single answer question and yeah. 10 extended yeah okay uh, okay dr apurva can you take this question there are a lot of questions about uh, the importance of an f i c o exam conducted by uh, the a i o s I think a poor wise start. I think I can uh, come in there. Uh, you know, I was given the FAICO. Now, uh, the FAICO is uh, is again a form of validation within the country of a, you know having a certain fellowship. It's not a fellowship in itself. Uh, in that specialist in that particular field, and uh, it is particularly helpful, I think, for people uh, like me who've done a senior residency, who probably have not done a fellowship itself, to have that tag. and uh, also it is you know again it is divided into a theory exam which is done online uh, you know through mcqs and then there are oscs which is the practical portion along with some a uh, viva so it is uh, i think it's a good exam to give and since our eios is running it the all india collegium particularly in india it, it makes sense and you know if you are interested in that specialty and you don't have a specific fellowship you could use this to add on uh, yeah i'm there yeah this is also yeah examination i'm the examiner for both refractive and for oclop last year also but basically there are 10 stations nine oscis and within the oscis we are supposed to keep one instrument in one image radio image and uh, tent station is for viva so basically there will be two internal examiner and one external examiner so it goes for a span of approximately 3 to 4 hours and then this is the only pattern like you need to appear for the theory examination which is conducted by external okay yeah apurva you wanted to say something about the fcio exam no i didn't okay. get the question i'm sorry i was i just went offline for a second yeah, the question was about a lot of people have asked about the relevance or the importance of an fcio exam by aios yeah so, i i think dr digvijay yeah. has already answered that question yeah. so yeah in in the north of india especially there are uh, senior residencies it's not called a fellowship in any particular sub specialty so i have seen uh, many of my friends from delhi uh, opting for the faico to call themselves a fellow of that particular sub specialty and it's a very 
a good exam to uh, i mean attempt and it's uh, of a very high standard i must say because the pass percentage especially in the theory itself is pretty low and uh, it gives you a very uh, confident feeling when you've cleared the theory and then you go ahead and give the practicals i think uh, some of the cornea people on the panel will know that uh, the core sub specialty especially is uh, particularly hard to crack so i'm sh- there's a, i think only one or two people who crack it every year so it's a very good exam and a very high standard okay uh, so uh, dr dave david matthew from Toronto has asked, will passing FRCS Glasgow make me eligible to appear for FRC of Thal Part 3? So maybe Dr. Rohan can help us with that. That's related to what we are. You need to understand that Glasgow and Royal College of Thalmology are uh, completely different systems. Glasgow examination does not give you uh, um, uh, any advantage uh, or any exemption from any parts of uh, uh, FRC of Thalmology. If, even if you are FRCS and completed all three parts of Glasgow, you still have to go through the grind of preparing for the part one uh, and reflection certificate. And the part when the pattern of okay. examination of Glasgow and Edinburgh, they are different. They are different. Like for Edinburgh, we have fought for the clinical last day. We need to appear in a neurosurgical unit and uh, we have a special neurosurgical clinical examinations. Oh, I think uh, Dr. Kasturi's video is stuck. Uh, so uh, may I request Dr. Vanishri to talk about her experience of uh, the part three Glasgow exam. I got to exam. make this even before or now. Hello? Um, ma'am, your voice is breaking up a bit. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think you know, my condition. Can you hear me now? Yeah, better. Please continue. It's 11 o'clock. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. No, I feel the pattern of clinical examination between Glasgow and Edinburgh is also different. And what I have seen when I was appearing like in the uh, like you have often before, well, you need to go to a different neurological um, uh, uh, center and then you have a totally dedicated neurological clinical examination which happens on the last day of your examination. But in Glasgow, this is only often with clinics. Uh, Dr. Vanishri, can you... Hello, uh, Devinder sir, because uh, I have taken the guidance when I was preparing for this exam and I would vouch for it that uh, when uh, they say that uh, life threatening and then vision threatening and cosmetic, it, it goes bang on the same way. You have to have to remember that. And one more, one more thing that I would like to stress is get your uh, yourself talking that is most important what happens is once we are into practice we are not really telling anybody what we are seeing or you know we are not describing lesions at all so suddenly after doing clinical practice for four to five years when you try to appear for an exam you are stuck you know all the things it's there in your mind but it doesn't come out so it is very important that for four to five months you action that you're seeing in your clinic in your mind at least or catch hold of a colleague catch hold of anybody and speak it out because only when you speak it will come out in the exams in those 10 minutes if you don't practice speaking it doesn't come out in the exam so i feel that it is very important that you practice secondly if you're not in a uh, multi-speciality hospital if you're in a single practice in the sub-specialities and uh, uh, like, you know, at least visit someone, catch hold of someone, get your doubts cleared. And uh, what I feel is, uh, uh, as it was told earlier also, make a WhatsApp group or make a Telegram group. A Telegram group becomes a huge uh, number of people together. But a WhatsApp group where you have, uh, like, say, five or six people appearing for the exam, 
uh, it really helps because usually people are from different sub specialties so they can help you out to clear your doubts say you may be of vitro retina and you have doubts in neuro uh, neuro ophthal so you know each each other uh, you can help each other out that's how i worked it out like i had a wonderful group of six people six to seven i think rather than eight to 10 people together and i mot i was the one pushing them no let's do this let's do this and in the last one month we had discussion every day about for two hours Uh, discussing questions and uh, practicing answering them, like just uh, like how Dr. Rashman sir said, that you know practice saying that oh I will do this or you know I will examine this or I will do this investigation. It's very important because over there it comes oh yeah we may do this or we will do that and that doesn't give a good impression at all. So uh, you know everything, but it's the way you speak it out that that's that actually changes the ball game completely. So uh, these are the few things that uh, I wanted to add. Uh, yeah even if anybody has any I, question i agree to is yeah i feel yeah, the most uh, important just, that we should practice as much as we can yeah yeah uh, one more thing i wanted to add is uh, dr apurva uh, had uh, asked uh, whether uh, any uh, all the sub specialties do they really go into too much detail are we supposed to know too much in detail so what i gathered from my experience is it's not like you don't need to know it from the level of a neuro ophthalmologist but as a general ophthalmologist there are certain uh, basic details that you should not falter like uh, uh, like you can go by kanski like whatever is there in kanski at least that much you have to know when uh, you are encountered with a patient like if a squint patient uh, if there is a squint you can't say oh i don't know anything about this so there are certain rules how you should be examining a squint patient so those uh, rules have to be followed to the t the first mistake if you make a mistake in a basic step you are gone you have failed so get your basics right uh, be it uh, like you know there are uh, very simple things like confrontation test which are usually not done in clinics but it is expected in glasgow exam so get your confrontation test perfected get your pupil examination perfected likewise uh, like everybody knows how to do 90 day exam uh, 90 day or 78 day examination or indirect ophthalmoscopy but again how you do it or whether you switch off the light or not or you know how you greet the patient again that is very important because how you go how you approach in the exam you can't just go and put your hand on the head of the patient or oh, look here turn your head or you know whatever so that way you have to be very particular uh, like you greet you don't have to really introduce yourself or anything or you don't have to take permission from the patient or oh, can i examine you don't have to say all that nowadays but then you have to be courteous and these are the minor things that they observe so uh, th these were my experiences and what i realized is uh six months before you give your exam get all these things perfected don't go hurried into the exam you have to prepare well be confident then only it will come out in the exam whatever you already know and you are practicing actually over to you thank you so much dr vanishri uh i think it's really late for everyone now so may i request dr digvij to kindly close the session and thank everybody please help desk the fellowship help desk which is there you can get in touch with all the speakers through us and you know we'll also have a directory soon and you can get in touch with other people giving the exams and we'll see how we can work that out to help you all you know get together and uh, it's it's really been a pleasure to have all the speakers here dr rashan sir dr minakshi ma'am rohan dr devinder and uh, dr akshay and uh, you know i also uh, thank entod for you know giving us this opportunity and uh, Uh, as far as all the tips and tricks are given here you know i think they're all very very valid very very useful uh, for all of us and then for any other questions or comments and there are plenty more that we haven't been able to answer i think we can individually respond to them in the comments uh, you know as they come and anything that dr ashwin would like to say before we no i think uh, thank you so much thank you yoshi thank you digvijay and ilkant and thank you akshay for organizing this and uh, any questions uh, we can keep it flowing uh, on a facebook page or on your link thank you so much okay so thank you you see thank you divakan and thank you all of you huh? good night